Hi guys, welcome back to another amazing episode of the podcast. Today we have on Heston Russell and he served in the military for 17 or 19 years. I can't exactly remember. He started Voice of a Veteran like political party and he helped raise awareness for suicide for prevention and being a really good leader. He works a lot on different values frameworks and all these different things and he he's a keynote, keynote speaker and in this podcast today... We go over how you can be a better version of yourself, learn from lessons in the military, learn from lessons from leadership, and then applying them in a, you know, a very important and specific way so that you can really overcome yourself and really integrate yourself, which is really quite fantastic. We get into like so many awesome things and Heston has such an amazing story to share, to share especially with his experience and time in the army and the service and the Australian, you know, special forces and all this stuff. You know, we're talking helicopter things and, you know, the times that he spent in Afghanistan and Iraq and these different missions and how they translate now and into real life and how finding your purpose and your values is so ridiculously important to you and how you can use those to best serve yourself. So, of course, guys, I have some coaching available, one-on-one coaching and a new coaching program called Overcome the Chaos and the intakes have started and it is basically for you. If you want to start investing in yourself and you want to you know, get more confident, overcome self-doubt, be, you know, increase your health and fitness levels and upgrade your standards, then this is for you. Don't miss out. This is some really high-level coaching. We go through so much. This program is ridiculous. Um, it's really quite awesome. I also have links below to recipe ebooks, bone broth discounts um, and a whole bunch of other services that I offer if you'd like to check out. Out. And this podcast is sponsored and brought to you by Eternum Labs, which are currently having a Black Friday sale. So if you go to eternallabs.com.au and punch in the code Corey, C-O-R-E-Y, you get a 10% off. So, And if you do learn anything from this podcast or is expiring, inspiring to you or motivates you or anything hits or lands you, I challenge you um, to like, share or subscribe. That would mean the world to me and help make this podcast grow, get that good message out there. So without any further ado, guys, I hope you love this podcast as much as I did. I was so excited to talk to Heston and I'm so happy that he lives in Brisbane because I'm like, bro, come down. We've got to train and got to talk about all this good stuff because it's super motivating and inspiring to me because some of it definitely hits home. So I hope you guys enjoy this podcast and we'll see you on the inside. Awesome. So, g'day, Hess, and thanks so much for coming onto the show, man. Hey, Corey. Great to chat with you, mate. Yeah, it is. So, what is something that you've been learning recently that has been beneficial to you? Oh, geez. How about we just jump straight in the deep end? <laughs> I, I'm just on a constant learning curve. And I think I'd probably love to start with that is that, you know, there's always something left to learn and there's always the potential to relearn something to be better at it, more effective as opposed to just being more efficient. But I think for me, the biggest thing I've learned over the last two years and continue to learn now is that you are the only person holding yourself back. And uh, as long as you're putting in the hard work and preparation, I think too many of us um, do definitely what I've done is put others launch into something. But uh, if you do that, you're going to be left waiting for far too long. So getting out there, backing yourself, trusting your own intuition, knowing that you've done the hard work and having the right team and support network around you and making it happen. Um, that's the biggest thing I could probably say is that one lesson I've learned most recently and continue to learn. Yeah. So what are some of the things that like, you know, that would hold you back that you've sort of overcome to progress? Well, I think, you know, a bit about my background. I spent 16 years in the military and uh, that's, you know, most of that was in special forces, admittedly. So I wasn't the conventional, you know, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir. But there's still a very hierarchical system. So, you know, there's a chain of command and there are, you know, authority levels and things like this. And, you know, for me, particularly in the everyday world, you look at those people like our politicians or whatnot, and you kind of expect that those that are in a higher status or stature or authority to you are there for those that, <clears throat> those that know what's going on or have the power, or have the control. But it's really not the case. It comes down to... You know, again, if you're putting in that work at your own individual level, we have the ability to achieve uh, impacts beyond what our assignment or our title or our label is and to trust that and to learn to build a support network around you that is definitely going to keep you accountable and keep you grounded and keep you responsible. But as long as you are doing everything with that lens of responsibility, you don't be the person holding yourself back, you know, particularly when you know what uh, needs to be done. Yeah, I really like that. So I've also seen a lot of stuff that you work on in terms of like values and things. I'd love to discuss about yeah. those. Like how do they sort of come about for you? 
Yeah, good question. So uh, I joined the military straight out of school. I was up here in uh, Queensland, schooled in Brizzy. So I turned 17 on November and I um, marched into the Defence Force Academy in Canberra uh, in February. And the military is a fantastic system that indoctrinates people into a life of service that is based on values. You know, you pretty much forego an individual identity, accept a collective identity, a collective purpose. And it's an amazing culture within defence. And statistically, you know, the suicide rate within uh, defence is less than half the Australian community average. And then particularly for the work I do now in the veterans community outside of that, that more than doubles once veterans leave the defence force. And a large part of that comes from those values that we're taught to instill within service include, um, you know, selflessness, uh, responsibility, um, others before yourself, um, courage, initiative, teamwork. And then you sort of transition to life outside of that service. And I got out of the military, lived in Sydney for a couple of years, and the values of society no longer really represent for the majority those values. You know, you go from selfless to selfish, from responsible to entitled, from teamwork to dog eat dog. And I lost my way. Um, I lost my way and threw myself into what we do best, and that's rapidly assimilating ourselves to our new environment. And I adopted those new value sets to fit in. And what I actually did was sort of form a wedge between myself and who I should have been and who I could have been. And then also, you know, like this photo over my left shoulder here is and the best version of me on operations in Afghanistan with my guys in 2012. And I was never so physically, mentally, and emotionally aligned to mission to task. Um, never so in the moment motivated and inspired by those around me. Whereas now in everyday life, it's constant news cycles. It's constant. What can I have next? That's anxiety. And at the moment with COVID and everything else, it's constant FOMO, fear of missing out. You know, I should be doing this, this comparison, this toxic comparison creeps in. And so for me, um, I got to a very low point uh, at the end of 2019. And I sort of had my aha moment, which was a, a suicidal ideation moment. And from there, instead of sitting there comparing myself to what I was and what I thought I should have been, I went back and had a look at those same circumstances, again, like that photo and said, cool. So what were what were the baseline value sets? Like who was I at the fundamental level? And that comes back down to values. And again, that was, I was responsible. I was responsible for myself. I was responsible for a team. I was authentic. I was forced to be authentic because I had to be in the moment. My actions and my attitudes defined me. Nothing that I could put out on an email or social media. And I had to stop actually letting social media be the platform through which I felt like I had to define myself. I had integrity. You know, I didn't lie to myself. Uh, and that's the biggest part. Um, I demonstrated leadership and a, a large part about, you know, I was an officer in the special forces and leadership is that fundamental element of a leader that is commonly missing these days because leadership is motivating people through inspiration. Most leaders control people through authority and through fear, but leadership is that uh, motivation through inspiration. And that's what I've been trained to do. Uh, and I always thought that I needed to have a team to demonstrate leadership, but leadership is simply Again, being your authentic self, doing things for the right reason and not worrying about what others think about what you're doing. And then lastly, which is my value is service. You know, I need to be in service to others or in service to a cause. Um, and that comes from that. And my love language is acts of service. And that comes from <laughs> putting others before myself, mate. So that's now, uh, that acronym spells out RAILS, R-A-I-L-S. And now I know these days, and that's literally, I have it on the whiteboard over there. I have it on my phone. That is, you know, when I know I'm going off the rails is because I'm going off my value set. And the last 18 months of my career in the military, I was responsible for redesigning and running the Commando Special Forces Selection Course. And the key thing about that, mate, this is your, you know, six-week selection course, five-week selection course where you, I started at, you know, 90 kilos and finished at 78 kilos. And you go through these incredible periods of individual um, assessment, you know, carrying you know, 60 kilo packs for 100 kilometers over three days through to feeling like you're going to drown in a pool, um, you know, silent running periods where the instructors don't give you any feedback, visual or audio uh, for three days. And 90% of the people on the selection course withdraw themselves from the selection course. But what that course is designed to do is to assess the right people who can then go on and complete the 12 month training continuum to become a qualified commando. It all comes down to who you are as a person not how many push-ups you can do or any of that. You know, we would even do the <clears throat> physical assessments whereby you'd have former Ironman. We even had a former Olympian on the course, mate, and they would pull off after seven days because they could do all of these physical achievements. But 
the, the assessments were set up. So it's, you could have done a thousand push-ups and you still wouldn't have passed that assessment, you know, but that person who struggled through 50 push-ups, but still just kept going and showed that mindset and that dedication, that determination, and maybe even helped someone else along the way. We're going to pick that person before we pick the person who can do a thousand push-ups. So it's coming back down to figuring out that true value of everything we do. And that's that human that is a part of that workforce. And for me, it's coming back to that value set that makes me the best version of me, regardless of the situation. But then when I'm in those situations, I can be even better because I'm surrounded by motivated and inspired by others and the purpose that I'm there for as well. Dude, that that's is a long minute. Minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh no, it was perfect, man. Absolutely brilliant. And I love the rails analogy because you know it's so it's like modern language everyone can can relate to getting off the rails. It was get Go back the on rail. the rails, man. <laughs> yeah. Responsibility, accountability, and uh, integrity, leadership, and service. That's me. Yeah, man. It's like it's beautiful. How does that value? Um, my values, hmm, really good in- yeah. interesting question. So <laughs> integrity is a huge one as well. That's one thing that I um, really try to hold within myself, um, especially in terms of I read a lot of myth and the story of like Zeus and all Greek mythology it makes a lot of sense because all the gods and genies and any like higher being, they can grant wishes and they can make promises and they can't go back on their word. And it's yeah. like, for me, I was like, well, that makes a lot of sense for why they're actual gods, but we're human. And we don't have to stick to our words. We don't have to, we can make a promise and break it. But if we want to achieve to have, you know, like a, you know, a better status, be a higher person, if we can be integral to ourselves and integral to our word, um, then it shows up better. And every time that, you know, I've, I've caught myself telling myself a white lie or I correct myself on something and I, I if I say I'm going to do something and I, and I stick to it, everything else in my life sort of just it's just so copacetic. Everything's just working really well. Spot on, man. The one thing we all have is our word, regardless of what you have, it's your word. And we too often take that for granted. A hundred percent. And probably some other ones, acts of service is my love language as well. But um, that's why I laughed when you said it. I was like, oh my man, we got another acts of service. Um, yeah, I'd probably say it's, it's really interesting. I'd have to think about it a little bit more, but I know integrity at the moment. Yeah. It's like the one that I'm working on as, as I, best I as that's not a great, that's not a bad foundation to start when you, so you've, you've studied the love languages. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's a real great book. So, uh, yeah. That book, when we'd finished the selection course, you'd finish it with a, a group of, you know, four or five officers and the rest were, um, you know, 20 or 25 um, other ranks soldiers to train up. But particularly my job over the next 12 months was to mentor those officers on the course. And one of the first things I get them to do is to read the book, the five love languages. And what I would do is I'd replace the word love with the word value. Uh, as you know, what is there? Giving and receiving gifts, words of affirmation, quality time, uh, acts of service and physical touch. And while physical touch might be hard, a shaking of the hand is easy, but appreciating that every single person in some way has uh, actually all of those love languages affect us and remove the word love and replace it with value. And by doing, going about yourself being more situationally aware and self-aware of how you can provide any form of those to anyone and everyone in your group and understanding who actually responds better to different things, you know, who responds better to words of affirmation, who responds better to just having you like stand by them or sit over their shoulders. They're doing something um, is actually really, really powerful. And that's that engaging the emotional level of people. And that's that when we get back to that leadership and inspiring people, you know, extrinsic and intrinsic motivations, you'd know about this, but I'm intrigued to know. So you the way you show love is through acts of service. How do you feel love or how do you feel value? How do I receive it? Um, yeah. Good question. So essentially, <laughs> I'll figure this out. We just talk about relationship-wise because I thought yeah. about this a lot. Um, I like getting touched. So like if, if we're just chilling and it's like me yeah. and, and, my, and my partner, currently yeah. single, but it was like an ex-partner. I liked <laughs> when we were like, it was quality time for me if we were just sitting around doing nothing and we were just like cuddling on the couch and I was getting like my hair played with. I was like, well, that's like an acts of service because like you're helping me relax. And right now this is quality time because we're chilling together right now. We're not stressing about anything else and I'm getting touched. This is great. <laughs> there you go. That's, yeah. that's addressing all of them. I mean, yeah. before, before COVID, I thought the way in which I received love or received value was words of affirmation, you know, particularly always being in a team environment. There's always, um, you know, verbal and nonverbal affirmation being provided you know, there's always sort of a measuring stick provided by people's reactions and whatnot. But uh, particularly during COVID and particularly during lockdown and isolation, and I literally broke up with my partner 
uh, we landed back in Australia from the US and went to the first planes arriving to do their own two week home quarantine. And then we got out for a day and then we had national two week quarantine. So we spent four weeks together. But then after that, um, you know, the whole world changed and I was in Sydney at that time. And uh, I didn't actually miss words of affirmation. I was okay, but quality time, not being able to hang around with people and particularly like yourself when you're acts of service, excuse me, and you're always doing things for others having people around you who are just there to be around you, who are not there and don't want anything from you. Um, I really found myself in like that famine, particularly given how isolated we needed to be. And I, I say this to a few people um, in the context of coming out of COVID and making sure we just like learn something from this, going back and having a look at what did you really, really miss that made you feel valued during that time? And perhaps that might be how you receive love or how you feel love or what is your love language in return? Yeah. And it's so handy. I think it's, it's super important to know, especially when you start like applying it to people that you know and people that you like when it comes to friends, family, because you can identify it within people. And then like for yourself is, you know, you can really give um, love as best as possible. Because I believe um, like as a quote of Frederick Nietzsche and he's like, is it not the, is it not the, um, shouldn't the giver give thanks to the receiver for receiving? And it's like, well, why do we do anything? I believe it's to be thanked. And because that makes us feel really good, <laughs> probably an acts of service thing, but <laughs> spot on. I mean, look, and, and even that just communicating, like the secret to all of this self-actualization, Newton's, what is it? Old mates, Maslow's hierarchy Maslow's, of now, yeah. you know, it actually comes down to knowing and understanding who you are. And I'll definitely say that here and now I'm a much better leader. I am these days because I'm finally authentic with myself because I know and I understand who I am. But then it also comes down to like communicating to others. You know, I have this like, grand idea about everyone actually assessing what their love language giving and receiving is and you know putting that on your instagram profile and you know having that conversation with someone hey like just so you know um i'm not needy i'm just a person who needs quality time like i just need someone to hang around with me or i'm a person who needs words of affirmation like every now and then i need you to do this imagine being so aware of who you are and what you need and being able to get that up front um you know, we'd cut through the first five, <laughs> five, six months, let alone three, four, five first years of a relationship for some people. And I would save a lot of stress. <laughs> but that in a speed dating game, wouldn't that be fun? Which, yeah. A lot of people think quickly jump on relationships that, you know, you need to find someone that's compatible with your love language. But I think that's actually the most beautiful part is understanding uh, how someone else feels valued or feels loved and then being able to speak to that language. You know, it's like learning French for the person. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And then like it forces you to grow. And then obviously when you're growing, the progress feels really good. <laughs> I also that's have emotional intelligence. That's how you develop emotional intelligence, being self-aware and situationally aware and being able to actually cater to that at an emotional level. Absolutely. I'd love to hear about um, some, some stories that you have when you've had to really demonstrate some leadership or demonstrate some emotional intelligence. If you can think of anywhere it's been like, you know, the pressure has been on and you know, you may, you may have failed sometimes and then you've overcome it or there's a time when you were tested um, and, and you like succeeded and was like, oh, I'm proud of myself for that. Does any stories Wait, that pop up? It's so interesting because again, I, I ended up serving 16 years in the military. I ended up deploying to Afghanistan four times, Iraq once, uh, East Timor. I did a bunch of other um, <clears throat> cool tasks around the place. And one of the biggest a uh, piece of advice I'd probably give is to pay more attention to being in the moment. I was definitely in the moment, you know, that deployment to Afghanistan, 2012, uh, myself and my platoon and the platoon, um, my platoon was about 44 guys and I was in command of that platoon. Uh, we conducted 67 missions, you know, that's like getting in three, four or five helicopters and flying outside the wire. And a special forces mission is like, you know, you spent seven days, if not more, planning up to actually go and target someone you've been watching in the sky or listening to on their phone. and um, you know, we killed 117 bad guys. We captured so many more. I lost um, one of my best guys, Corporal Scott Smith, on the 21st of October, 2012. And uh, I was just so in tune with the moment and there was no ego or attitude. There was, you can imagine in that job, mate, you can't, you can't pretend, you know, you, you can't pretend when you're in combat. You can't pretend when you're planning and you're actually going to be tested against a live enemy with bombs in the ground and things like this. So um, I was so in the moment, I was so in the moment there with the guys, but I never was taking stock of the fact that I was living the best days of my life. I never really took stock of 
um, you know, the level of inspiration that came with it. And I say that, you know, we had some terrible landings on helicopters. When you come into land, all the dust and dirt kicks up and sometimes the pilot doesn't know where the ground is and you hit it too hard. And, you know, I never once on those deployments feared for my own life, but I'll catch a, a plane from Brisbane to Sydney, hit turbulence and be praying to God 14 times before we land. It was just such a, a very different mindset um, as far as like mental health and emotional health and all this goes. But um, yeah, I, it's a hard question to answer, mate, because most of this is in, in hindsight, but that emotional intelligence uh, was apparently what made me one of the, the best at being a leader. And so many of my guys say that to me these days, and it's, it goes against the Australian culture to be talking about yourself this way. But uh, I, I truly, truly, truly cared for my guys more than I cared for myself. And I truly, truly cared for my guys and my team more than I cared about what my superiors thought about me. And throughout my career, that has been a big issue for me. I never was able to really appease and pander up, but um, that doesn't matter because even today and, you know, over the last year, mate, my platoon has been fighting against this ABC war crimes accusation that just in the last week has been found to be false. But the true test of culture is in crisis. And um, my guys and I have been, you know, sort of persecuted here back home at a time where in order to step out and defend ourselves, we were literally exposing ourselves to real world risks, which we agreed to over there, but not back here with our families and with our workplaces. And to see my guys come together so strongly and to be able to just still pick up conversations we didn't have, um, you know, five years ago and to just feel um, that trust and that respect. And it comes from having that emotional connection to people and, um, I don't know what you're like these days. You seem like a pretty easily connectable person, but to be able to actually have proper emotional connections with people these days is a skill set. I think I've definitely lost, particularly for those of us who have acts of service. It's very easy to engage with someone. And now you and I are having a good connected conversation here, but you know, it would come tomorrow. Like we could just move on and it's gone. Um, because we connect for a purpose, which is the conduct of that service as opposed to just connecting for the sake of connecting. And that's that whole quality time piece that I'm really trying to wean myself into. And um, it's actually allowing yourself to be vulnerable. It's allowing yourself to be, <clears throat> it's allowing yourself to be connected without having a purpose, which you can provide that person a service. And that leaves you potentially exposed and a level of vulnerability that you're not willing to accept that you're just there to be there as opposed to be relevant and useful. Yeah, which is like also like sort of like giving a gift of like yourself. But man, if anyone's listening to this right now, what you said then was absolute fire. Go back 30 seconds if you're listening to that and re-listen to that again. That was awesome. Connecting for the sake of connecting, I think is I've, so valuable. I've learned that. I've literally just learned that like the last six months. You know, I've been, and again, I've been through so many fantastic experiences <clears throat> throughout my career, but it's been the last year particularly dealing with the media that has taught me this so you know i've been on hundreds of interviews and tv and whatever and it's fascinating because like the media's always approached me i haven't approached them um, for the majority and you know they want something you know and particularly this is always talking about veterans issues we've got this royal commission into defense suicide and that's all the stuff that my organization sort of supports but you know when the media comes to you and says hey we want you to talk on this topic we want to give you airtime on this and it's kind of like, you know, wow, you know, you're really helping us get out there and, and help people and, and do this. And, you know, it's really actually a very vulnerable connection because they're, they're helping you. But then, you know, the next day they're gone <laughs> and they're only, they, they actually need you for a purpose and you're engaged and you get to be vulnerable and you get to really connect and express it all and feel like you're really magnifying your ability to help others. But the media and the reporter and the journalist just moves on to the next news cycle and you're forgotten. And then when you do have something you really want their support with, if it doesn't fit with the current news, it moves on. So the last year has really uh, gone through some real ups and downs where you've connected on such an emotional level and being able to get that message out there and support each other only for the next day to be stone quiet or the next week or the next month. And you're kind of on this roller coaster ride. You just have to realize the difference between um, connection for a purpose and the connection just simply to connect uh, and that's actually what we need so much more as human beings man that is huge i think that is so so powerful so what like motivated you after the army to get into this and really start to start public speaking to start your party and all of those other things as well 
Um, it was again helping people. Mate. So um, throughout my career, you know, like I told you, I was always the platoon commander, always always the commander, and um, you know, giving orders, giving briefs, motivating teams, and all that was everything that I did. And then when you sort of leave the military, there's this gap whereby uh, you kind of don't have the confidence in those skill sets applicable to outside life. Mm. And unfortunately, that's the narrative for so many veterans. And <clears throat> particularly that point came in 2019 when um, within my own special forces unit, within the Australian Army in general, I'd known more people to get out of the army uh, and get away from those high risk situations only to take their own lives, um, feeling isolated and um, uncertain and irrelevant in a life after service. And I sort of, that's what swung me into my ideation moment. I thought I could be useful given I had a social media following. I had this lovely sort of poster boy, you know, medals on the chest photo and all of this that I could finally bring some um, attention where it needed to be and it couldn't be avoided. But um, I actually then in my aha moment realized that I could be so much more effective finally grasping all of those skills and experience that I had from my career to actually put that into practice myself and not have a politician or someone else read out, you know, the letter I'd written there on my laptop, but to be the person who was out there talking about it. And I started speaking to a couple of my friends from my um, unit and guys that I worked with. And it was just a domino effect, mate. You know, nine out of 10 guys that I spoke to uh, told me that they had experienced their own suicidal ideation as well. And about six of those had gone, hey, I've never said this to anyone. And they're like, you know, I'm okay. I just have been to that place and I felt, um, I felt wrong. I felt like I needed to hide that. I felt embarrassed. And through just simply sharing my story and having those deep connections with people over that time now I've spoken with you know over 1500 veterans and everyday Australians who've told me you know they've had their own struggles with suicide or struggles with depression and all of this coming out of particularly during COVID but the, all the regular things that happen in life you know even members of my own family felt comfortable for the first time saying that to me and that's where I was just like okay well you know we need to break the stigma on this you know a lot of people will see me for you know smiles and medals and they used to see me for biceps and better things but you've got that job now mate and it's <laughs> it's and it's wielding that with responsibility you know it's not being defined by um you know my mental health is not being defined by that i you know i'm still embarrassed saying that i struggled more with my mental health um, outside of all that risk and danger sitting at home on my lounge in sydney with my sausage dog but it's wielding that now as lived experience as a responsibility and I'm not a victim. Like I'm fucking more ready to go. I'm sorry, I said the F word on you. You can swear I'm as much ready. as you like. <laughs> I'm more ready to go here and now than I ever have been. It comes from accepting your own vulnerability and realizing what is your authentic self. So then the mission has been this gradual process of, right, so where can I best apply those skill sets, um, being responsible and leading by example. And that started with um, starting up uh, an organization, Voice of a Veteran, that's now called Veteran Support Force. Uh, and then I kept pulling the strings and over the last year campaigning for this uh, Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide, realising that so much of the veteran community dating back to World War II and the Vietnam guys is just trauma. People have this resentment, people have this trauma that they need an outlet and that Royal Commission is it. Uh, and then meeting with so many individual politicians and senators and everything else at Canberra, realising for the majority we have the wrong people in government. We have people who carry... Um, their focus as being their self-progression or the progression of their party. They have all these staff members around them. They have more media advisors than they have policy advisors. And realizing that, um, again, I used to think with my military hat on, those at the top of the country are those that are our top leaders. But most of these people don't have any professional training in leadership or management, aren't supported in that they do. Go out there and if one side says one thing, they say the other. And if I want to really... Uh, apply myself to helping to solve so many of these issues like we spoke about earlier the differences between those value sets that saw me achieve my best in service through to what we see today in society it's needing to get out there and um, help people to see by example that there is a different way as opposed to talking about it so yeah we fought lodged the application to form up our own political party that's called the australian values party and uh i'm looking to run up here in queensland and we're just literally awaiting that approval process, which should come through in the next month. And again, that's just about, you know, every time you hit a false crest, mate, every time you think you're at the top of the hill, there's always still someone there who's, you know, preventing something or delaying something or stuffing something up um, that's holding people back. So I'm just like, all right, let's, let's take it to the Everest and let's make it happen. Oh, for sure, man. And that was like 
awesome and i'm super pumped for you and super excited it's like it's just so motivating to see someone out there you know doing something for such a good cause and you know just enjoying the connections all along the way and inspiring and in people because i think like you know real good leadership quality is just sort of being that person that others can benchmark themselves off um especially if they're like oh so you know what's this person doing if, if they're doing all these other things and i want to be better maybe i could take a little bit of wisdom from them which is super inspiring which is you've done for me so um a big thank you for that what would you well, I'm, say i'm definitely not i'm definitely not perfect man you know particularly <laughs> Particularly during that two years where I lost my own way, you know, I got into anything that I was being enjoyable, being an everyday, um, <clears throat> an everyday Australian and catching up on lost time. But uh, I think it's just realizing, you know, particularly with the amazing gifts that I've had from all of that military service and getting to see really what, you know, the human spirit can do and everything like that, for me to then waste those gifts and not put them into practice with the lens of responsibility, not entitlement, I'd be. Um, you know, I couldn't live with myself. I'm not being authentic. I'm not, that's not integrity. That's not leadership. But also, mate, the key part is come on May with politics. Like it's not going to change anything. It changes my ability to magnify, I think, the service and support I can provide. <clears throat> but regardless, like this mission keeps going. And that's the biggest thing I think I've learned along the way is to remove any and all labels. You know, we love putting labels on people. We love putting people in a box. So many people struggle and I've had so many managers try and come and work with me and going, cool. So like, what is your brand that we can sell? I was like, look, I'm just testing, you know, but uh, a lot of people think, you know, you need to be a politician, you need to be in office, you need to be the captain of the team. But as you would know, mate, you know, you, you don't. Um, those are force multipliers. They can magnify the impact you have. But if you're doing something for the right reason, you need to focus on that purpose, not focus on that position or title. Man, I love that so much. So what about the people, let's say they're sort of in a position where, you know, they want to really start investing in themselves and they're like, they've tried a few things, they, they kind of feel like they've got the inability to do everything or they want to get their results faster or they want to remove risk from all the stuff in their life. And they're like, man, I just want to start working on me. Like, and just, it could just, whatever you think in terms of some of the best things to do that may have worked for you or that you would encourage or that you've learned, what would you say to people who really want to start? working on themselves yes. you see a lot of us a lot of people try and focus on that purpose you know having a mission that is going to motivate and them inspire them and doing all that but the one thing i've learned is that purpose comes and goes whether we want it to or not and then when that purpose goes it comes back to who you are and who you surround yourself with excuse me so what i've learned is to put the majority of your time into developing who you are and who's around you and, uh, you know, even just this last year, mate, I swallowed my pride and went and got myself a personal trainer at the gym. You know, that was even like this humility piece coming from former special forces guy, this, that, and the other. But like my training was dropping off, you know, my motivation levels are dropping off, you know, realizing that you, it's actually okay to ask for help and to learn how to ask for help. And, you know, if you want to put this into a, a financial amount for, you know, for every $1 you spend out on a business or whatever, make sure you're spending $2 on yourself. Because at the end of the day, the number one appreciating asset we have in our life is ourselves. And the number one thing, um, you know, this was my fitness philosophy back in the military days. You know, I worked out because the fitter I was, when I was on target, the better I was at doing my job, which is thinking with my head, you know, leading with my mouth and planning and doing my job there. And for all those people who have that question, first and foremost, it's sitting down and planning and figuring out what you want to do. And figuring out those steps along the way but the foundation to that is investing in yourself you know your physical mental and emotional health and for all of us that's so intertwined i don't know about you but if my head isn't in it my workout will be shit whereas when my head's aligned my workout's my best my body responds the best you know when my eating is terrible you know my workouts and my body don't respond either way and it's just getting that down pat and that fuels your emotional health you know it's all all intertwined and getting out there and moving and then filling your life with those who value add, not those who detract from you. But those that you can actually have conversations beyond the current headlines or the latest post or who you want to hook up with that weekend. That's great. It's good to have those people. But my support network these days comes from a place of where I call it's the humility, uh, sorry, the uh, authenticity pizza pie. You know, you cut yourself up into eight slices or 12 slices if you're more complicated. And find those, find those people in your life who cover off on each and every one of those piece, so pieces. So within your life, you have those around you that you have the ability to be 100% authentic with in some way. Some people, that's only two or three slices. Um, but I think particularly what I learned coming out of my latest 
four year relationship was that you need to find more than one person to be able to be vulnerable with because most of us are pretty complicated animals and uh, I have the bad habit of trying to put any, everything into um, one bag, into one person. And you could just imagine my poor old ex-boyfriend trying to go through 16 years worth of, <laughs> 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 you know, having no previous exposure to anything. And, you know, I pretty much suppressed that entire part of my military career. I never spoke about it. We never spoke about it because it was just a point of um, unfamiliarity that instead of me expressing that that was a part I needed to speak into, realize and still feel attached to, I just hit it and change myself. And when that, that pendulum swing comes back, the relationship is the thing that goes. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so what do you think, what, what are some of the actual tangible things that you've actually done in terms of physical, mental and emotional health that have like worked for you? When you say like sit down and planning, is there any sort of exercises that you've done or physically, like what is the best things that have worked for you that you've used or books or resources? Just so, so people who are listening, they have some tools. They're like, oh, I want to try that thing, Heston said. For sure. First and foremost, like checklists work and actually writing shit down to stop relying on yourself to remember things. You know, every day I have myself a checklist and, um, you know, writing it out the night before is also a great way unless you're someone who overthinks things. And But, you know, just having a constant checklist you refer to and we all have our great phones these days. I do that, but sometimes it's great to write it down. The biggest part for me, and this goes back to actually, um, you know, military mission planning 101 is uh, defining the purpose. So it's so easy to, in everyday life, and if you're responsible for people, people allocate tasks. But whenever in the military context, we gave someone a task, we had to give them a purpose. It's like, hey, man, I need you to do this because that needs to be done for this, 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 and this. So letting people know the higher purpose behind a task, what you actually then do is foster initiative and you foster the ability for that person to then actually appreciate what the end result is. And this is just backcasting 101, but it's focusing on purpose. So as when they are achieving that task, if something else kicks up along the way, they're like, oh, hold on, hold on. You know, he might not have seen this, but I'm going to need to do that as well in order to do this. And you empower them to do that. Where if you just say, hey, go do this, cool. And you're going to get exactly that. And that's micromanagement. And you're going to train people to rely on being told exactly what to do. Um, so that's a, that's a huge part for me. But then coming back to, for me, it, it's personal routine and organization. You know, time is the most valuable asset we have. And the busier and more successful we get, like time just runs away from me and it's terrible. So factoring in and even putting in calendar if you need to and understanding when is the best time to train for you. You know, it's, it's lunchtime after this and my best time to train is at lunchtime because it gives me that middle of the day spurt. I don't drink coffee, so it's my time to make it happen. Meal preparation. And I know you're all over this dude, but back in my, back in my heyday, back at, you know, 27 year old Heston Russell, I had, you know, every meal laid out. I had my, oh, Oh, we'll be back. This is my camera decided to turn off for some reason. Hang on a second. And continue. <laughs> Sorry, saying, bro. You're all right, man. Back back in the day when I was, you know, good to go, 27-year-old Heston, I had everything meal prepped out. You know, I had my breakfast smoothie in the morning. I had, you know, poached chicken or, or roast chicken, sweet potato, broccoli, all this. You know, I had everything planned out. And eating for me was a, a process. Uh, and it just fueled the system. Whereas these days... I emotionally eat like hell. And uh, unless I have my meal prep set out, then I'm, I don't hold myself accountable to it. So, mate, I even, ready, 36 years old, I even asked my mum, she lives down the road, if she can help me out. And a couple of times a week, she comes and drops meals off to me. Because, uh, and I'm okay with that. I am okay with that because also the biggest thing I've learned is to ask people for help. You know, if you need help with something, you could just imagine, you know, my mum's a nurse and she's, um, She's not at a retiring age, but she's getting towards that. And I feel like disgusting asking my mom to do something for me like that. Like it's belittling her. And she's like, there are not many things in this life that I can currently do for you. So for me to be able to cook prepared meals for you, please understand you have made me feel so valuable. And that's been such a huge part for particularly people like you and I who are acts of service, allowing others in to help you. You know, it's not about embracing uh, vulnerability. It's actually helping them. So um, mate, routine, nutrition, sleep is the last one. And putting that bloody phone down and putting that computer down like an hour before you go to bed. For me, I don't read books unless I want to go to sleep. I will like read three or four pages of a book and I am gone. 
Um, and that just really helps you to bring yourself into the moment. Most of us struggle going to sleep at night time with that hyperactive mindset, hyperactive brain. It's because we're thinking forward or thinking back. Whereas finding something like a book, not something that's on a, a screen because it has that whatever reaction with whatever you're doing to help you bring into that moment. Absolutely. And um, the last thing, mate, is my dog. And you know this. I, uh, for anyone out there who's single, who's lonely, or who's whatever, or who needs something to help them get out every day. Um, you know, I never had a dog growing up. I now have my little two and a half year old sausage dog. And as far as uh, truly learning uh, the love languages, truly learning um, unconditional love, I constantly happily learn from my dog. Because again, the happiest mental mindset comes from the ability to live in the moment. And if you ever want to live in the moment, watch, uh, watch a baby or watch a child or watch an animal like a dog and just see them in their most authentic self, uh, especially a sausage dog who embraces their vulnerability of short legs, long body. They are just happy in that moment and they are happy with you and whatever you bring to anything. Um, and just, you know, breathing into that moment and realizing, you know, the world's going to keep spinning and the sun's going to come up and we can actually learn from, from every direction, not only just from those we think are above us. Yeah, man, that is so beautiful. And I couldn't agree any more that message. And I couldn't agree any more with the asking for help because um, I do yeah. appreciate the people I had to give. I had a similar, uh, similar experience with my dad. I remember that clicked for me when he asked me to do something. I'm like, no, man, I've got it myself. It's good. And he was like, oh, let me be a dad. Yeah, that's and I was mate, like, we, we're the worst. We are the worst. We're I mean, the worst. Yeah. <laughs> so now anytime he offers for, for help, he's like, oh, I can help you with that. I'm like, thank you so much that helps so great like instead of going the other way i just dive into the other way and um he loves it he's running around helping me and i'm like this is great he feels great I'm like this is just great energy all around so thanks for saying that um because that validated that um, for myself so it comes from a good place and that's that next level of emotional intelligence you know appreciating how others respond around you and what others around you need and you know communicating as opposed to putting yourself out for them always which i'm sure you're probably like me you do the same but you know realizing that this is how they're trying to feel value let them feel valued for sure yeah. uh heston you are a world-class stud thank you for all the stuff that you're doing man for anyone who is listening where can they find you where can they follow you what's happening how can they get involved uh, easiest mate is probably, um, my personal website, hestonrussell.com, uh, H E S T O N R U W S E W L.com. And from there, look, as far as social media platforms, my Instagram is pretty much all that I use. Um, you know, there's just too many things to try and track and chase down, but, um, like you have got a podcast on there, it's Heston Russell podcast. I've got the links to charity website, veteran support force. I've got links to the political party, Australian values party, but yeah. Um, estonrussell.com oh beautiful man well thank you so much for coming on to the show Corey mate been a pleasure and I will look forward to actually getting to the Gold Coast and saying hey good day in person one day oh man don't know if I'll do a gym session with you I've seen you in action you're uh, I need to I need to get back into it <laughs> oh, come on mate I've seen those muscles I'm like he can push me <laughs> uh, we'll see mate we'll see yeah for sure man well big thanks again thanks Corey